Café Scientifique is a monthly series of expert-led discussions on science and culture presented by the Bell Museum of Natural History. For more information about the Bell Museum or to find out about upcoming Café Scientifique programs, visit bellmuseum.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Okay, good evening and welcome to Café Scientifique. Yay, all right! <laughs> Café Scientifique is brought to you by the Bell Museum of Natural History. And yeah, all right. Oh, this is a good group tonight. Hey, thank you all for coming out tonight on uh, another Super Tuesday. It's awesome. I, I hope everybody notices that I'm wearing my Bernie Sanders hair tonight. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I am going to turn it over to Leah now to introduce our speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin, as always, for a very energetic opening to the show. Um, I just want to say thanks to everybody here at Bryant Lake Bowl. And, of course, uh, did you ask us who sponsors the Cafe Scientifique? Who knows? <laughs> Excellent. Yep, the Bell Museum. So we're very happy to be here tonight to present our speaker. We wanted to do some food programming for Cafe Scientifique. And uh, Dr. Lavuza here wrote us an email, uh, replied to, to an email invitation to submit some ideas for programming. And he had such a range of topics that he could speak on. Um, just And he might talk about some of them tonight. But there were so many interesting ones. But one of the talks was titled The Physics of Confections. And I just thought that that sounded like a real treat, no pun intended, for all of us here tonight. So um, he may mention, though, that this talk also comes out of science that was done by his sons and daughter, and daughter two sons and a daughter, and, uh, in high school? school? Elementary school, OK. And, uh, and so there's a paper authored by, he proudly has told me, by Labuza, 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 and Labuza out there <laughs> floating around in the world. You might be able to find it on the internet. <laughs> um, but I would love to just hand the mic over to Dr. Ted Labuza and let him get started with the presentation. Thank you. I need you to help me. Oh, gosh. OK. <laughs> I want you to pour these ice cubes into here okay. and put two or three in each of these. So what we have here is a, a little experiment. We have a paper plate, an aluminum pie pan, and we have my magic melting table. You've got to put on this, on this one also. And I have, I have three people. Who's the, uh, the paper one? So you're going to be it. You watch these. Look at the time now and tell me when they all melt. Uh, you're going to be there, and you're going to do that for these. And then. Uh, it's already melting. How about you? You're going to watch this. So it's already, we started two minutes. And just shout out when it's all melted, shout out the time. And we'll talk about it at the end, why this has occurred. Okay, so I'm going to talk about various things. I, I just wanted to also say a little bit about some new technologies that we have before we get into candy. Um, how many have heard about? ultra-high pressure processing? A couple of you. Okay. Um, Starbucks just bought about six months ago, they bought this company here. It's juices that are pasteurized but without heat. Okay. Uh, I think they're about seven, eight dollars a bottle, not, not cheap. Uh, Hormel, uh, the former director of research did his PhD on this process uh, for me in there, so I've been involved with it. So think about this. You take this room here, and we've got a basement below, and we put vertically a gun barrel from a battleship. So 20 centimeters thick walls, that's vertical. The bottom is sealed, and we put food in packages, which we vacuum pack so there's no air in it. So like deli meat or this plastic bag, you can't put in a bottle or can. Uh, and we put it into baskets and lower it down into this one and a half story tall battleship barrel. We fill it with water. We seal it. It's hooked up to a pump that's called an intensifier pump in the bottom basement 
Uh, when it's running, nobody can be in a room, so there's motion and uh, uh, vision detectors to make sure people are not in a room. And it pressurizes that barrel to 99,000 9, 99, feet, okay? The depth, three times the depth of the Marianas Trench, okay? And what it does is it kills the microorganisms that are in the food. It doesn't affect the texture of the food at all. Uh, the food tastes like fresh orange juice or whatever it is, stuff like that. And why it works, and maybe you can hold the microphone for me for a second. I'll just say this. Water molecule has an oxygen and it has two hydrogens. They're about 104 degrees C apart. And then under that, uh, water is an interesting thing because it forms a cloud around nucleic acids, like the DNA of the organism, for, forms a cloud around proteins that helps stabilize the structure because there's a lot large polymers. And that cloud is based on interactions between water and the protein with this structure. Well, under that high pressure, you actually squeeze the molecule like this and that disrupts the structure of the nucleic acid and the microorganisms die. Okay. Uh, but the proteins, they don't get affected so that they come out just like originally. Uh, actually, one of the first processes that was done was for, um, what's the most dangerous food that you can eat? That's up on the top of the list, okay? <laughs> You heard me talk yesterday about that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, raw milk is oysters is is the top one, but but actually it's it's both oysters and and uh, raw milk are I would I put in the same category. Very very dangerous foods. Well, you can pasteurize with high pressure, and there's about six companies in Louisiana that do high pressure processing of oysters and they taste and have the texture of a fresh picked oyster, but there's no organisms in it. And they're the, only or they're the only oysters that are now allowed to be served in California because of the danger of it. So very, very interesting thing. So, seven minutes, 23. Okay, we still got ice there. I gotta take this off here. Ah, so. Let's get to the topic. Uh, oh, I should say one other thing. Another way to do it, I forgot that. Has anybody bought these? These are pasteurized eggs in a shell. Okay? Okay? Um, and it says, safe for any recipes. How would you be able to pasteurize egg in a shell? Could you do that in a high pressure processor? No, because there's an air cell in an egg and it would crush the egg. This goes back to the old days of pasteurization, low temperature, long time. And if you do it at the right temperature, about 54 degrees C, and for 55 minutes, you can make these safe for any recipe. Uh, the big market for this is for people like me who are over 70, uh, that uh, if you're in a nursing home or in a hospital and you want a sunny side up egg, when you crack this egg open, it looks like a raw egg. And so you can make a sunny side up. It's, there's no white that's coagulated or anything like that. So that low temperature uh, allows the organism to get killed, but the protein to not get denatured in there, which is interesting. 726. 726, and you had? 723. Oh, oh so, so that was pretty close. All right, this is still there. All right, so we're gonna talk about candy. These two people here uh, changed the world in some way, which we'll talk about in terms of what we're going to do. So I'm going to talk about some of the science I did before I met them and they did something. They were, uh, uh, Harry was a chemical engineer in polymer science from uh, RPI, Rensselaer Polytech, working at General Foods, which is, doesn't exist anymore. And his living partner, Louise Slade, was a PhD in chemistry, and they worked at the Tarrytown Research Center in New York, and I'll talk about what they 
what they did. So if we take a food, a high moisture solution, elastic gel, like uh, it would be some fruit or whatever, or a colloidal dispersion, or a cell trap structure, like a banana or whatever, and we dry it, and physicists are now beginning to work in this area, but they're embarrassed by saying that they work on food. So they've termed something called soft condensed matter. <laughs> and there's a journal of soft condensed matter. <laughs> and I, I kept on arguing with him, well, you know, a hardball candy is not soft. You know, so we gotta have also not so soft condensed matter as well. So if we dry it down to a semi-moist state, and I'll talk about what that means, or a low moisture state. The, because we take the water away, usually rapidly, we end up what we call is amorphous structure. Uh, that's a physical term, but let me talk about what it is. It can be two states. It can be glassy state. So you, make a potato, you take a potato chip, put it in a fryer, take a piece of potato, put it in a fryer, hold it for the right amount of time, take it out. It's crispy. It's brittle. Okay. Uh, or if we don't bring it down so much, uh, like making a caramel candy, it's rubbery. So we can have two different states with pretty much the same type of materials that are going into it. Uh, and we can go back and forth. We can take a glassy material and make it rubbery like a potato chip, and then dry it back down again, and we can make it brittle. Okay, so we can go back and forth. And if it's in this rubbery ductile state, if we store it at certain conditions, and it's got sugar in it, then we have the sugar crystallizing, and it causes some problems. And we're going to talk about that as we go along. So let me, let me talk about a concept that didn't exist before the 1950s. And that's the concept of water activity. Uh, it's something that we teach our students. I was in groups that are, were around the world that were the first to come up with this principle. So let me take this very simple thing. A, you've seen these packages, right? In vending machines, cheese and cracker. Uh, that won a very negative environmental award for, they said, why the hell don't you put the cheese on the cracker and you won't have as much packaging in there and you wouldn't have to put that little paddle so you could spoon it, okay? Oh, good, good question, why not, okay? So let's say why not. So usually this, I, sh I shouldn't call this cheese, it's a uh, fake <laughs> thing that looks like cheese. It's, we, we call it rubbery or ductile, the, the Mechanical engineers call it ductile material that can flow if you force it through. It's usually about 10 to 45 percent water, depending on how creamy you, you want it. So it's in this side, and on this side we have the crackers, and they are brittle. You take them. Here, let's crack that in front of the microphone. You hear that sound? Okay. Uh, you could put that back together by gluing it if you got all the pieces. Uh, uh, you ate part of it already, okay. <laughs> That's all right. We'll forgive you. Uh, so uh, this is usually 2 to 5% moisture. Notice 10 to 45%. If I put them together, what's the moisture going to do? Right, so it goes from, one, from the high moisture to the low moisture. And what's going to happen in the end if we left it a long time? Soggy cracker, but about about moisture contents. Did you end up with the same moisture? No? Huh? Well, this is going to go down, and this is going to go up. Okay? And that's, that's a good question. You know, what's going to happen in there? So here we put the cracker. Let's say I took the cracker, and I put it in an environment at 75% relative humidity at 25 degrees C and I measured its moisture change, let's say from 3%, and eventually it equilibrates out at 15%. Okay. And I take those crackers, put 100 grams, put it into a jar, mason jar or whatever, really tighten so that it's not gonna be affected anymore. And then I do my second experiment where I put the cheese, 
at the same relative humidity and temperature, and it's going to lose moisture, let's say, from 45% down to 25%. And again, I seal it up. Okay. And now I do my third experiment. So I have 100 grams of cheese here at 25% moisture and 15, uh, 100 grams of cracker at 15% moisture. And I'm going to take the jars, take the duct tape off, put them together, put the duct tape around, and wait for maybe two months to see what happens. So the moisture is going to move from here to here, right? right? Uh, so will they equilibrate to 20% moisture? Why not? Does the crack will absorb more? Well, maybe you've got something. But there's, there's a physical chemical property that is never taught anywhere except in food science programs. Okay? Uh, and it comes from this equation. I'm, I'm not going to show you many more equations. Okay? I just wanted to point out there is an equation for this that says the energy state of a molecule in a, either in a vapor state or in a liquid state is equal to the energy of the uh, pure substance uh, plus a gas constant times the temperature in Kelvin times the natural log, which you, know, you don't have to worry about what all this shit means, of the activity of the, of the species. And the activity is a physical chemical term and for liquids that evaporate, that activity is related to the vapor pressure that the water would have in a given system divided by the vapor pressure of pure water. Very, very simple thing. We call that the activity of the species in water. We call that A, which is small capital, not small capital, no, a, a, a small A with a subscript W. And it's called water activity. Or we call it A sub W. I have a license plate on one of my cars, is A sub W. <laughs> I'm crazy. <laughs> so we have cracker, 100 grams, 15 grams of water, 85 grams of solids, cheese, 100 grams, 25 grams of water, 75 grams of solids, and if we total it up, 200 grams, 40 grams of water, 160 grams of solids. So if we take the average moisture of the mixture, it's 20%. So if I was working somewhere, I would send it up to my analytical lab. They would first grind the whole thing up and uh, say, yeah, it's 20% moisture. Yeah, it's true. But then I said, oh, wait a minute. I sat in some stupid seminar by some guy who says, no, there's something about thermodynamics that's involved in here. Okay? And what the thermodynamics says is that what the equilibrium is, is that the water in each different domain, the cracker, the cheese and the air are all the same. So they all come to the same water activity. So if we look at this, here's the cheese here. It's going to lose water. The cracker is going to gain water. And they are going to come to an equilibrium water activity. Now, who cares? Well, this, is a, this is a huge business that is a real problem for the food industry. I would like to make a sandwich that lasts long. My bread has a water activity of 0.8. My meat has a water activity of 0.98. And so the bread gets soggy. So I've got to figure out some way to slow that down or prevent it. Uh, there's, this research has been going on for 20 years to try to find a nice, simple solution. Let me give you a good example here. A crispy cone, 3% moisture. Uh, it's water activity. Uh, Oh, it didn't show up on here. Its water activity is about 0.25. I put, fill it with ice cream. This is a frozen novelty. Any of you ever bought frozen? No. Cone? Yeah. Uh, so the water activity of ice cream at that temperature, the freezer, is about 0.85. So the ice cream is going to have moisture transfer into the crack, into the cone. What's going to happen to the cone? So it's going to become an ice cream sandwich. You know, that, we like ice cream sandwiches, but we want a crispy cone. So how do you solve this? Eat it quick. <laughs> well, it's going to, it, the problem is that it's going to occur before you get to the house with it. Okay, That's a problem. Huh? Make the cone drier. You can't make it much drier. 
So what what do you put in between? Something that is edible in it. Chocolate. Chocolate. Yeah, that's what they eventually figured out what to do. Uh, chocolate is about 50% by fat. You've already heard about chocolate in there. Uh, at that temperature, it's going to be a solid crystalline form, and it is a very, very good barrier. One of my students actually measured this, and it's equivalent to the water vapor transmission of, you know, those, those big black bags that you use for uh, in the lawn and for uh, garbage cans, stuff like that. That's six mil, six thousandths of an inch thick polyethylene. It's a very good barrier. So the chocolate works, okay? Uh, am I going to put chocolate in a beef and uh, sandwich thing, you know? No. Am I going to put fat in there? You know? Maybe, but, you know, it's going to work, but, you know, more calories. And that's, that's our real problem, is the more calories that is going to occur in there. So if we take and plot the water activity, it goes from zero to one, and Water activity is essentially the relative humidity that the food has. And uh, let me just show you here. Here's a little water activity meter. It's made by the Germans. Uh, it's got a gauge in here that r has relative humidity. So I put a trail mix in here that I've made just recently, and it's equilibrated. I, I can't show it to you, but I don't want it to fall all over the place. But it says that the water activity in there, there was a lot of fruit and a little bit of peanuts, and the water activity is about 0.68. Okay. So the uh, nuts picked up moisture from the raisins and stuff like that. This. <laughs> <laughs> smells bad, no? <laughs> Rancidity. Yeah, the, the nuts picked up moisture, and that moisture caused the nuts to go, go rancid faster. And I'll talk about this in a couple of minutes. Uh, and if we take one of the raisins, well, it's, well, it's not too bad yet. I need it. It's, uh, it's not as soft. I made one with gummy bears. Put some gummy worms as well in there. So here's a gummy worm that was in with the crackers. Uh, you want to break that in half? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Another one. Uh, I gotta do it right now. How would you ex how would you describe that texture? It's uh, brittle. It's really hard. Brittle. Glass. Yeah, very very glassy. Very yeah. Brittle. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. The polymer scientists call that glassy, okay. and that there is a physical property that goes from the glassy state to the rubbery state. Uh, you've eaten potato chips. Or glassy or rubber? Both. Both, yeah. Out in the picnic at 75% relative humidity in one hour, they're soggy. And so that we call that a rubbery state. And that's what we're going to talk about, is that, that interesting transfer of what happens in there. So here's 0 to 1. That's the water activity. So that would be 0 to 100% relative humidity. And... Fruits, vegetables, meat, and stuff like that have a water activity of about 0.98, very high. And they're going to transfer moisture very rapid into a dry system. Uh, beef jerky, somewhere in here, less than 50% moisture in a 1 gram per gram of solids ratio. Water activity, around 0.8. Has to be less than 0.8 from a legal standpoint, so that's safe to eat. Gummies, around 0.7. Uh, Raisins, rice, and rye. Here we got two different states in there. We got dry material, the rye and the rice, and we got the raisins. Raisins are a 0.65. Uh, the cereal is about 0.25. And so 
over time, moisture is going to transfer into the uh, uh, raisins. Uh, now, these were raisins I pulled. Can we know something for you? Yeah. yeah. This? Okay. Raisins I pulled out of a, a cereal box that I had around for six months. <laughs> can you bend that? I can bend it just a little bit. It's pretty, it's pretty tough. Pretty tough. Yeah, it gets, the, before it gets brittle, it gets tough, leathery. Okay. We want some leatheriness in uh, beef jerkies, but if it gets too leathery, it's going to pull your teeth out. Okay. Uh, lots of cereal companies have been sued by people who have broken their teeth uh, from eating raisins, raisin brand cereals. Okay. So we can solve that problem, and I'm not going to get into much detail. We can solve that problem by adding a different plasticizer. Uh, that raisin behaves like a polymer. Uh, how many of you made like gallons of food? Then you put them into Tupperware containers and you put them in the freezer so you can have meals. I, I usually make two gallons of, of uh, Italian uh, sausage and you know my special recipe. And uh, when you put the hot stuff into there, that's pretty soft. Right? You can see, you can bend it and stuff like that. So you put it in the freezer, and if you're at 3 o'clock in the morning and you decide, yeah, I'm going to go have something, I go out there. I had a little too many beers <laughs> that night, and I take it out of the freezer and I drop it. Okay. That's be that plastic became brittle because it was at cold temperatures, and it will fracture, and you now have big holes where it broke in off in there. And that's, again, a glass transition type of phenomena that occurs in there. So with, I'm not going to read through this list, but in our laboratory at MIT and then when I came here in 71, uh, we came up with all kinds of solutions to use of water activity term. So for example, we know that if the food has a water activity of less than 0.6, no microorganisms can grow. In fact, no microorganisms that are pathogens can grow below a water activity of 0.85. So are dry foods safe? No. <laughs> We've had outbreaks of product with, that are dry foods, uh, like chocolate, like peanuts. Like they're all below 0.85. Uh, some microorganisms, like salmonella, can resist dehydration. And so they go into hibernation, and when you eat them again, and you know, the biggest, peanut butter. What's the water activity of peanut butter? Nine, eight. Hmm? Nine, eight. No? Point five. Well, you're pretty close. It's about point four five. Okay? It's low. It's soft because of the peanut fat. Okay, so it spreads nice and easily. You put it in the refrigerator, it doesn't spread very well because the fat uh, solidifies in there. And uh, that Peanut Corporation of America case uh, resulted in 350 food companies having to withdraw product because they didn't do the right things that they should have. It actually was the uh, grandfather of creating the new Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act called FISMA, Food Modernization Act, which I was very involved with in there. Um, I am uh, on a um, uh, food safety committee for the Food and Drug Administration. I was appointed last year by the uh, commissioner in there. And so we've been, we've been very worried about that. We're looking for ways to inactivate in a dry state. That high pressure battleship barrel is not going to work. And low temperature, long time microorganisms in a dry state have much higher resistance to heat. And so we're looking for other ways uh, to do that. So one of the things I published, which has been uh, cited maybe over 5,000 times, is this stability map. I published this in 1971. Uh, by 1971, we had figured out most of the critical things of water activity in terms of food. And in fact, what happened is that all of a sudden, the pharmaceutical area realized that was important for them too. This is one of the, you know, like canning was something that we started. It became into the pharmaceutical and this whole concept of water activity 
uh, became a very important thing. So one of the critical issues around that time is uh, the, law, the change in texture acceptability of a product. And so in 1981, uh, one of my graduate students here at the University of Minnesota, we published a paper on water activity effects on sensory crispness. So here's a measure of the hardness of the product as a function of water activity. And what we found is somewhere around 0.4 and up to 0.5, and this, was, this happens to be for saltine crackers, all of a sudden the hardness of the product goes down significantly. So we know water activity is important, but it doesn't tell us why. And in fact, when I sent in that paper, it was rejected because I didn't say why it occurred. So I came up with a, a little paragraph uh, that I put in there. I says, well, the water bound with the starch, and now when you bit on it, the water acted as a lubricant, and so the starch slid past each other, and it became softer. They accepted that. I had absolutely no proof for that. <laughs> absolutely no proof. So, after that publication, lots of papers, hundreds of papers, people started working on this problem all around the world. Uh, there was a meeting which had 250 scientists in uh, Wageningen in Netherlands on crispness of food, stuff like that. Uh, uh, and in 1980, 88, and 89, those two people, Slade and Levine, that I showed you before, they came up with this idea of the glass transition phenomena that comes from chemical engineering and polymer science in there. As I said, I gave up boating. My, my boat's name was Water Activity 2. <laughs> <laughs> my wife's car is N-T-R-O-P, Entropy. And my other car is Kinetic, because I studied kinetics of reactions. I mean, weird, you know, <laughs> weird scientists. And uh, I gave up fishing. This is one. Uh, this fish I actually caught by hand, but we won't go to that story here. Okay. <laughs> so, what we knew from water activity is that a water increase changed things. It caused things to become sticky and caking. Uh, you you all have probably uh, observed that if you left brown sugar in a can for a long time, all of a sudden you've got a brown brick in there. That's a caking phenomena. So that's crystallization of sugars and starch. Uh, bread staling, getting hard, sitting out, is a crystallization phenomena. And so from polymer science, it says that as a function of percent solids, you have this line that's called the glass transition line. And I'm not going to go into how we determine that, because it's a very, very complex thing. It's called differential scanning calorimetry. Below, above the line, the product is softer, more flexible, lower modulus of energy. Uh, sugar can crystallize fast reactions, and below that, it's glassy. So we have a rubbery state here and a glassy state here. Uh, what we know is if we increase the temperature uh, or uh, by going in this direction or increase the moisture by going in this direction, that there's lines that represent how soft the material can be. And so the uh, more we're above the glass line, the softer it is because of the elastic modulus, which comes from the uh, mechanical engineering of this. So these are things we know where moisture gain becomes soggy. Potato chips, cereals, crackers, extruded snacks, like here's an extruded snack. You've all seen these. Is this crisp? <laughs> Somewhat. But, but, but bite. Here, take a piece and bite one. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> Some Christmas to it. Uh, the more air that's foamed into a product, the softer it becomes. You know, because because it, it just it doesn't have the, the solids that show the breaking in it. So one of my former students working with my former PhD advisor said, is that we can take a theoretical state diagram where we have the boiling point line, the freezing point line, the solubility line for if it's sugars, if it goes across that line, it becomes crystalline. 
and we can put the TG line here, and now we have a map that shows us what's rubbery, and this little area here, what is glassy. It's a very small area that's glassy. So if I take a potato slice that's at 98, 90, I should say 95% moisture, and I put it in hot oil, I'm gonna boil it above the line, and then I cool it down and bring it to here. So I go from a, a crisp, wet material, because you bite on a, a, a potato slice, that's a different kind of crispness than what is with uh, the polymer thing that we're talking about. And that's, that's in this region here. So I uh, was looking for, uh, back in the early 90s, a way to try to come up with techniques for teaching uh, our young scientists who are on their way of how they could understand it from a very simple way. So I says, I'm going to do it with my children. So I started off with my son, Ted. Uh, he did Christmas texture changes in brittle cookies, basically like vanilla wafers and chocolate wafers, the stuff that you, you buy and use it for various things. Uh, this is the texture meter here. Uh, he presented it at our national meeting of my scientific society, the first from work he did in eighth grade, okay? Uh, this is before posters, real posters. If, you, if you're, those of you who <laughs> have been in science, <laughs> when you had little sheets of everything in there. Uh, so he presented at a national museum in New Orleans. Here's the device. So you mount it over, we have different kinds of mounts and things like that, and then we bend it, and we see how it cracks. Uh, if it's brittle, you get a straight line, and then it breaks. If it's a material that yields, so it's soft, you're gonna have a, a line that's linear here, reaches a maximum, and then it so, slowly uh, decreases because it's too wet. So here's 7% uh, moisture, 23 degrees, it breaks, 45 degrees. So temperature and moisture content are important in this. Uh, if we store it at 0% humidity for four weeks, we get a stress strain curve, which shows it's brittle. It goes up to 25 newtons. If we store it at 75% relative humidity, it goes up, reaches a peak at only one newton, and then it extends out. And so we can very easily have some mechanical properties that measure this, and it becomes important for doing that. So that led to a PhD student of mine who was funded by a number of cereal companies uh, to come up with uh, what is the key thing. So we did lots of more experiments, different kinds of measurements of this TG curve, and uh, a lot of sensory testing. So this is sensory testing. We train people to evaluate crispness, and you see up to about 30 degrees C, it's crisp, and then all of a sudden it becomes non-crisp. And what we found was that on that graph I showed you before, there was a line parallel to the TG line that said if you went above that line, you became non-crisp. And so this now helped the food industry, especially in the snack industry with crackers and stuff like that, to really do this. Uh, a lot of people don't know much about differential scanning calorimetry, so we do a lot of work for them uh, in terms of uh, doing this. So here's his presentation again. Here's a paper, well actually this is a book chapter which he was a co-author in, and not only that, but the AAAS uh, picked 20 students around the country uh, that were in grade school to go to a uh, forum in Beijing, China, uh, to present their poster there, uh, and he was one of them. And in fact, one of his uh, kid in the same class, I uh, worked with him on uh, pH effects on uh, enamel of teeth, and he got to win too. So we had two people from St. John the Baptist uh, School in New Brighton for this. So to ensure good Christmas, you want to have make sure that the glucose level is less than 0.5 because sugars lower the TG curve, and that makes it more ascent. Uh, you want to have a thicker slice, like they do here. Uh, longer deep fat fry, so lower moisture content, which is what somebody said before. That's a good idea. 
and then have a package that is a foil laminate. So it's a very, very good barrier to moisture pickup. Okay, and so uh, it's more expensive, but it gives you the shelf life you want. So the second one was caking phenomena that I wanted to look at. So I decided, uh, well, actually, it came about my son, uh, middle son, uh, ordered some cotton candy over the web. Okay, when it reached our house, uh, and it was some a summer about, oh, no, 15 years ago, whatever, uh, when we lifted up the bag, there was big, hard clumps in the bottom. It wasn't cotton candy. And so I says, hey, this is a good thing to look at. So we looked at cotton candy. So when you make cotton candy, you take crystalline sucrose, you raise the temperature above 210 in that ro rotating cylinder that's in the center. It melts, spins it out as a liquid stream. It produces a glassy material. If you take that material and we'll look at it, it's not crystalline at all. It's an amorphous material. Uh, you catch it on a paper cone. And if the humidity is high, uh, it's going to collapse, and then it'll recrystallize. So it'll go back to the original state. So this is just the, the map that we showed, that I talked about. So here's the boiling point line, the solubility or uh, line for the sugar. Here's the rubbery state. Again, a very small region here where you're at room temperature that it's a glassy material. Uh, and um, we worked with people at University of Wisconsin to produce the, this curve. So here he is making cotton candy. Uh, I made a mistake the first time I did this. Okay. It was winter time. We had to get something going. And I bought some of these cotton candy machines, little ones. And we did it in the kitchen. Okay. Uh, what's the humidity inside your home during the winter time? Low. You know, usually less than 30%. Okay. So one is the cotton candy didn't stick to the cone. But any other surface that was a little bit cooler, <laughs> I hold the whole, whole damn kitchen was now covered with cotton candy. <laughs> Three days to wash it off. <laughs> that was my penalty. He also presented at the National IFT, so he was the second one doing that. So here's the experiment. Here's the TG line. These are actually measured. You get random because it's a, it's a very difficult thing to measure. And we stored product at 11, 33, 45, 50, and 75 percent relative humidity in jars. So we made the cotton candy, filled them up into a, a ball jar, and uh, went about it. Uh, so my son learn how to do x-ray crystallography. Uh, uh, the first time we went over there, there's a sign, no food allowed. It's in the characterization facility. I says, no, we're not going to eat it. We're just going to do x-ray crystallography. And they said, what the hell are you doing? You know? <laughs> you know. So if you do a crystal, you get, in the old days, you get a pattern on a piece of film. I mean, I did work back in the 60s on film. Now we have something that actually gives you something that looks like a chromatograph. You see this on CSI, whether it's uh, Cocaine or heroin or whatever type of thing for crystals. So you get very distinct peaks at different angles in there. Uh, this is the instrument itself, very easy. The most damage you could do is not close it, and uh, somehow or other it goes on, and now you start, start spilling x-rays all over the laboratory. So they're very keen on that. Okay. So here's my initial cotton candy in a jar, uh, and here's it being x-rayed, and you see this uh, halo pattern. Very low counts, spread out, no peaks at all. That says there's no crystals in that cotton candy at all. Uh, this is sucrose, crystalline sucrose. You see the very big difference in the patterns between them. So we could identify that, in fact, that the cotton candy was amorphous and not, not crystalline. 33% relative humidity, about 5% moisture at two days. That full jar had now collapsed. That collapse is due to the fact that you have enough water that it breaks the bonds between the sucrose molecules, and the force of gravity 
pulls it down. So it's uh, a uh, effect of gravity that's causing it to flow in there. Uh, at three days, now this was hard as a brick, okay? And it was uh, crystalline in there. Uh, here's the x-ray diffraction results. You start seeing now all these peaks for sucrose in there. So you could see very clearly that this occurred. Uh, this is at 45%, and now at 45% in, uh, in five hours, you saw the same crystalline pattern. At 75%, uh, one hour. So this summer, when you go to State Fair, or Washington State Fair, or whatever, uh, buy two cotton candies, eat one, watch the other, <laughs> and taste the other every now and then. Okay? And what you'll see is it's going to collapse, and then it's going to get grainy because you're making sugar crystals in it. And that's what happened with that stuff that came in there. So this was a nice way of explaining the whole glass transition effect of moisture on doing something. Uh, again, the solution is good packaging and place, do not place in direct sunlight, store it in a cool, dry place. And it applies to other things itself. And here's my son at IFT. This was my former advisor, and this is one of my colleagues who worked with him on uh, coming up with a state diagram. So candy thermometers. Grandma knew all about glass transition. Uh, you use that candy thermometer, and uh, if you, what you do is you take a sugar solution. Yep. Oh, sugar solution, yeah, and uh, bring it up to a certain temperature, add more things to it, uh, and then, so you've got a higher solids content, then bring it up to the boiling line and carry it up, and then bring it down in temperature. And so if we want a caramel, we stop at about 248 Fahrenheit, bring it down, it brings it into the rubbery state, and it's soft, and pull, like taffy type of thing. If we want a hard ball, we bring it down here, and it's in a glassy state, or peanut brittle, it would be the same type of thing. Uh, but you know, it's all on that thing. Now, what drove me here for a project for my daughter is uh, uh, we have a farm in Northern California. We were out there uh, one summer when she was still in grade school, and uh, it was about 115 degrees outside, uh, dry, dry heat, very, very uh, hot. We decided to take our car and go up to Lake Tahoe to swim. I had bought some Altoids, and Altoids you used to be able to buy, and I haven't seen them in a long time, are little hard balls in a metal, metalized can. You remember that type of thing? Uh, and um, well, we left them in the car, and this was hard ball candies, and we came back. And it was left in the car, and what do you see? What does it feel like? <laughs> is it soft? It's not soft at all. It's, it's, oh, no, it's no, 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 no. Put your, put your, oh, yeah, hey, whoa. Yeah. Man, it's like jelly. This is, it's like <laughs> jelly. It's like jelly. I mean, if you leave it sitting out in the air, it'll dry out and get very hard, but it's jelly. So what happened to those hard-boiled candies? <laughs> Melt? They go back to the rubbery state. It didn't melt, right? It's flow under the force of gravity. Okay. Uh, how many of you eat melted cheese sandwiches? Okay. Cheese on a pizza or in a, you know, when you do it on a melted cheese sandwich, you got to change that to uh, gravity force cheese sandwiches. <laughs> the, the fat melts at 35, 36 centigrade. But that doesn't make it any softer. It's the protein that flows. Protein can have that same property in there, which is a very interesting property in there. Uh, key, of course, and I put this up here just as an extra thing, is uh, if you leave cars out in the sun in there, uh, this group has done a lot of work. It was done, here's the uh, uh, pediatric journal. They showed it didn't matter what the color of the upholstery or the car was you got about a 40 to 50 degree, or the beginning temperature, you got about a 40 to 50 degree Fahrenheit increase above the air temperature inside the car. Uh, so a 60 degree car can go to 110 in two hours at 
if it was 83 Fahrenheit, it takes 15 minutes to hit 109. And if you have a body temperature in a child that hits 107, they die. So that's, uh, that has nothing to do with candy, I guess. But <laughs> some science. <laughs> so here we are. The initial sugar solution is basically sucrose solution. You bring it up to boiling, carry it out, and then bring it down in here, and you're now in this region here. Uh, so it's a hardball candy, and both moisture increase, moisture temperature increase, or temperature increase can cause it to change in there. And that's, that's what we're uh, facing in this. And this is what my daughter did. She basically made a scale. Uh, Here's loose and dry. If you turn the can over, it drops out. Uh, somewhat sticky uh, at two, very sticky, but will not fall out, and then eventually flows together so that the structure is gone completely. And basically, that's related to the glass transition line. I, did, I left that off just because we want to finish this whole thing. Uh, I did write them. Uh, they didn't have any warning letters on it. And now they have on their cans, keep in a cool, dry place. Okay? And uh, I also asked them, because that's the other thing is that moisture can affect this, is that they should put a, a rubber um, uh, gasket, gasket in the uh, lid. lid type thing. Right? OK. You get five points. <laughs> in my class, you get $2. <laughs> And as Catherine says, don't keep it in the car. So my last thing, soft cookies. Uh, you make a soft cookie, it's basically the chocolate chip type of cookie. And uh, if you leave it out, uh, even in a sealed container, in two to three days, it becomes crumbly. You know, it's not got that nice, soft, especially if you eat a chocolate chip cookie when it's hot coming out of the oven. I love that. All right. uh, so it goes from something that's a soft cookie to something that's a hard-aged cookie, stuff like that. Uh, it's really firm and crumbly. It's not, it's not crispy because the structure is different than what we have in a potato chip type of thing. Uh, back uh, in 1958, uh, the, a couple of companies came up with an idea of making a chocolate chip cookie that had an, two layers. There was an outer layer that was a dough with sucrose, okay, and then an inner layer, a dough with high fructose corn syrup. Normally, you would have all sucrose. High fructose corn syrup lowers the um, TG line so you can get a more soft product. So you have a soft outside and you have a, a nice sort of hard outside very important because if you put a bunch of soft cookies together and you put them through a distribution center, okay, you're going to end up with a mass of cookie that's all stuck together. Okay, so that's, that's what they did. And this uh, x-ray crystallography proved that type of thing. So here we're doing that. We're making this rubbery. That's the inside of it. Uh, the problem is that when you're in that rubbery range, then sugar can crystallize. And if sugar crystallizes, uh, it acts as part of the plasticizer with the water. So you get less pla plasticity, and so you get a more and more harder cookie in there. And then water that the sugar was reacting with does not react with the crystal. That water transfers into the starch granules, and so you even lose water at the same time. So here's a soft cookie at one hour. No peaks at all. It's all amorphous. Within one day, you start seeing sugar crystals forming. Five days, more and more. Ten days, really significant amount. Uh, you see the crystals here and there. They're not connected together, so it doesn't form a hard texture. It's just single crystals that are growing inside there. Uh, and if you measure the texture again, like my son did, uh, Here's that one hour, way down here in terms of grams force. And in 21 days, that's about five times harder up there. It's unacceptable hardness. So, you know, two nice instruments to do this uh, in there. And this is a study that we did for 21 shelf life. 
Uh, this is the control. So it started up and then it slowed a little bit, but then it got harder again. At 400 uh, kilopascals, that's the modulus, elastic modulus, that cookie is unacceptable. Okay. So you can see that, you know, in about six days it was unacceptable. Uh, if you took sugar out, it gets even worse. See, it's up here, in there. If you uh, added some high fructose corn syrup, a friend of everybody of sugars, <laughs> you know, that uh, it works pretty well. It keeps it down here. We didn't carry it out longer than that because we were just looking at bakery type stuff that uh, you would buy from a local bakery in there. And then we looked at other combinations. Uh, what we found is that we could really slow down the crystallization of sugar by adding in raffinose. Does anybody know what raffinose is? Ever hear of that? It's a sucrose molecule, glucose fructose, and it has a ta and that's in a plane, and it has attached to it a galactose molecule. So it's three moieties that are present in there. Uh, we can't digest it. It's one of the main sugars in beans that creates a problem of flatulence. <laughs> so we can call them flatulent cookies, okay? But 5%, but 5% raffinose significantly reduced the uh, uh, hardening of this. And that's because what happens is the growing side of the crystals, the crystals may start, but the growing side of the crystals are sucrose, so the glucose, galactose, glucose, uh, fructose, that attaches onto that growing site, but you got a galactose sticking up from that site, and no more sugar can come down in that area. So it slows down crystallization significantly. So I'm not going to go through all these mechanisms. So let me end with this. Uh, when Slade and Levine first got involved in this whole area, they uh, basically told us that water activity was a useless term. Okay. So we had a big battle in science. We had a big meeting in Nottingham in 1991 where actually both sides were throwing stuff at each other. And I says, you know, I says, wait a minute, you know, water activity is really important in chemical reactions because we know that. I've, I've published 200 papers on uh, things like that. Um, uh, what glass transition does is it tells us something very much about how to control problems with texture. So it's a very important tool for the food scientists, food technologists who's creating products itself. So when they taught a short course here, I, in, uh, I invited them out to dinner at D'Amico Cucina, when it used to have the restaurant on uh, First Street. Was it First Street there? Yeah, First Avenue, yeah. And, uh, you know, nice sil silverware and, pl you know, uh, candles on the table, crystal there. My wife and I got there early, and uh, uh, Harry and his, w and his partner came in, and I got up to uh, introduce them to my wife because they had not met her. And um, as clumsy as I am, I knocked the table, and a glass flipped over and wet Harry with water. And I says, Harry, that's water activity. <laughs> so, 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 so two years later, uh, I gave my short course to a, a group of about 50 people in uh, Sweden. And um, a young lady came up to me. She says, you know, Harry really blew it. He should have said, no, Ted, that's a glass transition. And with that, I will end. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, let me sure. grab that. All right, I will take questions from the audience. Uh, give, raise your hand, and I will get over to you. Thank you for your talk. It was very informative. Um, is the biggest factor in cookie freshness or like palpability the sugar content that you mess with, or is it? Are there other factors that can also be easily controlled? Well, the the, the biggest problem is textural changes. Okay, um, the um, 
people who have tried to make, do various soft moist cookies for with six months shelf life. Uh, the problem is the sugars that you would add in, let's say high fructose corn syrup that would lower the TG so it would stay softer like I showed. Unfortunately, they react with the proteins present through something called the Maillard reaction that produces darkening. Well, if it's a, you know, a chocolate chip cookie, maybe it's, it's not that bad, but it also produces very bitter flavors. And we don't have a good method to slow down the Maillard reaction. So that's one of the key problems. Uh, and now with everybody wanting uh, clean labels, you know, you don't want to see sorbitol or mannitol or high fructose corn syrup on the list. And that's, that's a real problem. So we're, we're inhibited by the consumer concerns that are out there. And thank you again for your enlightenment. What I'm wondering is irradiation has been downplayed a lot because of other hazards. Is this Canon method going to resolve what the radiation can't do? Is the uh, Canon method going to? Uh, Canon method um, is extremely expensive. Okay. Uh, a, a single unit is uh, um, about $3 million. Wow. Yeah, and um, it's a batch process. So it's, you put it in there, you hold it for 15 seconds, and then you take it out. Uh, so uh, what? Hormel has done is they've put in six of them so that they can run it, you know, uh, it, with the right time scale, they can run it as almost a continuous process. Uh, irradiation has been around as a, uh, I, I went to MIT as an undergraduate uh, in, and I was in the uh, nuclear physics program okay, because I, I um, when I was in high school, I built a, um, a laboratory in the basement of my house, and I synthesized six different explosives. <laughs> Today, I would go to jail for that. <laughs> uh, and um, I, because my family didn't have uh, much money, I, I got a job in their Cobalt 60 irradiation facility, and I met some people from the Army who were working with somebody in the food engineering program, and uh, I got excited about that, and the uh, food engineering program uh, gave me a three-year scholarship. So that's how I went from nuclear physics into food engineering in there. Uh, and um, the, the problem with um, irradiation is uh, cobalt-60 is a high target for bioterrorists, you know, the, because you can blow up and then you can spread radioactive material around. There is an E-beam process that you turn a switch on and off, and so there's no radioactivity, and there's a few uh, things around there, but you you say the word of radiation, and to everybody, that's anathema. You know, that's a, a real problem. You know, so I, I don't see it as a alternative. And uh, uh, it's it is used most of the spices that you have, because the way spices are handled in the uh, Asian countries, they have a high chance for containing pathogens. Uh, they're sent. The spices are sent to Rotterdam, and there's an irradiation facility there in E-beam where they irradiate the spices so they uh, get rid of all the pathogens in there. Uh, no, no company who puts spices into their formula, let's say you're making a, a frozen dinner, you don't want spices that contain salmonella in there, and so uh, that's what they do. And uh, FDA has just come out with a, a uh, risk assessment of spice, of the spice industry, and it's pretty bad. Okay, so that's where radiation is a very important tool. I'm, I'm curious when you talk about that risk like of spices that have or have not been irradiated, for example, how, how does that fall into, like what's the relative risk of that compared to other things that we worry about? Well, the, in, in most cases, we um, put the spices in like my spaghetti sauce and we cook the hell out of it. You know, so that's going to inactivate it. So we have very few incidents. Uh, at the most, it's usually something like pepper, which is sprinkled on an egg or whatever, and uh, it's not been through the irradiation process in there. So, I mean, I, I think the risk is low compared to eating a raw oyster or to eating sprouts. You know, so. <laughs> 
And what's the specific risk on sprouts? And then I'll get up over to this question over here. Because I heard some people kind of yeah, gasp well, when we yeah, said sprouts. It's, well, it's, it's, uh, the numbers are hard to come about. Um, the, um, in many cases, uh, it's not a huge out, It's not an outbreak. It's individuals, and they don't report it. And so we don't know. I mean, uh, numbers that I've seen from the CDC, Center for Disease Control and Protection, they didn't change. They, it should be CDCP, but they added on protection in name. Uh, they said that the risk was about one in 250. For E. coli. Yeah, okay. for for sprouts or or for oysters. I mean, uh, Jimmy John's has had five outbreaks in the last four years. You know, and they still they. It's interesting. They uh, uh, will serve it at their store. And if you ask for sprouts, you, and I was there today, and I didn't ask for sprouts, but I asked the, <laughs> I asked the, the kid that was working there, he says, well, he hates lettuce, but he loves sprouts, you know. And uh, uh, they, if you go online to order and you ask for sprouts, a little window pops up and says there is a high risk of getting E. coli or something like that. I can't remember the words. That, and so they have it on their website, but not, not in the store. Interesting. I'm going to head back yeah. here, and then I'll come right back here. Can, it, this isn't food exactly, but I'm interested in the chemicals used to line packaging, to line cans, and to line like bags for chips. And then, are you going to talk to us about the ice cubes that melted? Oh, yeah. What, what was the times? Let me do that. Seven twenty-two. This was this was a little bit longer. Seven thirty-six. Seven thirty-six. Then. I lost track. You lost track. <laughs> <laughs> you heard some weird. If I had big ice cubes, uh, oh. generally it's about nine minutes uh, for the magic tray. It's about 15 minutes for the aluminum tray, and it's about two hours on the paper. Ted, can you grab the mic and explain why that why that is, and yeah. repeat those yeah. repeat those yeah. average times? Uh, if with a uh, with a large, I, I forgot to take my ice cubes from home. Okay, so I went to the ice machine, and they were wet, and I cooled them down a bit, but it didn't work. Uh, the, um, on the paper, it usually takes two hours for a, a typical ice cube battery or freezer. Okay, uh, for the aluminum tray, maybe about 19, 20 minutes, and about eight minutes on the thing. Now, uh, why these differences? Okay, uh, has to do with heat transfer. Uh, there's, there's differences in heat transfer between the three plates. The plates act as fins. Okay, um, you go to your radiator in a car, and you have pipes that are the radiator pipes, but you see metal fins all around. Okay, that increases the heat transfer rate out. Okay, so that's that's one thing. I try to keep them all about the same size, but the, the plate, the thing is a little bit long. But the difference is in the thermal capacity. We call it thermal diffusivity in the materials. And so uh, the uh, paper plate has a very low thermal diffusivity, so it can't transfer the heat. And so it w won't even act as a fin at all. And the aluminum, a little bit better, and the black plate. Uh, you can do this experiment at home. Uh, if you don't have a magic tray, all you have to do is use a a, uh, a iron uh, a frying pan, and it works just as well for doing that. So it's just some engineering. We use this in our engineering course to teach it. But water has some interesting properties in this. All right? So now what was the... And the second question was uh, about the oh, linings of cans oh, and yeah. potato chip yeah. bags yeah. and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, the, I mean, that is a big concern of the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, and... Um, the way that is regulated, a, uh, a food package is a food additive under the law. Okay, very interesting thing. Uh, not only that, but uh, I should mention that food irradiation is not a process. It's a food additive, which, which is crazy. And um, so uh, you have to prove that the kinds of things, and it's not on the surface, it's actually inside the plastic itself, that the diffusion uh, of the material from the surface into the food, over the shelf life of the food, uh, allows for no more than about a half a part per billion in the solution. And so then they basis on the toxicology, they make some decisions on that. 
it's not an easy area. It's a really controversial area. The BPA issue has been a big one for many years on there. And uh, you've got big groups on both sides of it that are doing toxicology. And so we don't know. We really don't know. And I just, I, I'm going to get to your question next. But I just wanted to, it's kind of funny to talk about another cafe that's coming up at this moment, but I always kind of think of our cafes as an ongoing conversation that they all kind of tie together. Um, our May Cafe will be about contaminants of emerging concern. I can't say for sure that she's going to be talking about BPA and such, but she might be a person to ask that question of when, when the time comes. Well, the, the two, let me just mention, two, yeah, the, yeah. two of the most uh, uh, interesting ones is, uh, and so now the meat industry is beginning to do that, is we have allowed for 40, 50 years for uh, meat producers and poultry producers to put low levels of antibiotics in the feed because that improves the feed efficiency and the weight gain and stuff like that. And what we now know is that all these antibiotics has led to severe increase of antibiotic resistant pathogens and that we're losing antibiotics to treat diseases. Okay, that's my next uh, thing that my students are going to do in my class. Uh, they're going to write a scenario on that. Uh, it's a really important one. Uh, the other one is in water, and Flint, Michigan is a good example, but uh, uh, we have a real problem uh, on the Mississippi River. Uh, a friend of mine who is uh, a biology professor at St. Cloud State, he studies a very interesting small fish uh, and looks at how it changes depending on where it's growing. So he takes fish samples from above St. Cloud, uh, before Minneapolis, after St. Paul, and then at the bottom, uh, the end of uh, Lake Pepin. And uh, this fish increases in number of males, fishes that become hermaphrodites. And it's almost like 75% down in Lake Pepin. And he attributes that, that to the fact that uh, we use a lot of estrogen drugs, uh, especially for female hormone treatment, and about 80% of the drug goes out in your pee, goes out into the water treatment plants, and water treatment plants don't uh, take that out of the water. And that's why it increases going down. I'd hate to drink water down in New Orleans. You know, <laughs> you know in fact, we had a real problem with uh, brown rice that was being harvested, uh, it was about two years ago, in uh, Mississippi, and uh, it had like 40 times the level of arsenic in it, and it was because the arsenic comes down the stream and got into the water and got ingested by the plant in there. So, I mean, a lot of concerns out there. Interesting. Oh, let me pass the mic right over here. I hate to go back to the sprouts issue, but if I grow my own sprouts, am I going to have the same problem with pathogens? I mean, is it the way that the sprouts are handled for the restaurant industry, or is it no. something about the sprouts themselves? No. Um, do you sit outside your garden with a shotgun and chase away squirrels and birds? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the main organisms are salmonella and E. coli. Okay, if you grow a, have a sprout farm near a dairy farm, there's a high chance of E. coli transmission in underground water, in, in especially Salinas Valley. The dairy farms are on a hill, and the um, uh, vegetable farms are in the valley, and shit runs downhill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... So, I mean, you don't know. Well, but I'm growing them on my windowsill in a little... Oh, if you're growing them inside, then your windowsill. Yeah, so it's not out there. Probably, the probably not. Skin. Yeah, you're probably okay. <laughs> the, the, the big problem is the... I mean, the, the biggest sprout uh, outbreak was two years ago in Germany. Okay, Germany, Ireland, uh, Ireland uh, France, um, and it was traced to fenugreek, seeds, was, was harvested from seeds in Greece. Uh, the seeds were shipped to, in, in uh, Egypt, the seeds were shipped to Greece where they were grown, and the growing conditions to grow the sprouts uh, uh, commercially is you use uh, uh, 35C, 37 degree C room, so you get rapid growth and bigger growth. 
and that's the temperature where organisms can grow. Uh, the, the organisms are embedded inside the seed itself, but now they can get out and start creating. And uh, uh, this got into all different kinds of restaurants all around Europe. Uh, they thought at first the EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, thought it was tomatoes from Spain. And so they banned all tomatoes from Spain. And that killed that industry. They lost $200 million uh, that season. And eventually, they found that it was fenugreek. Okay, so uh, it's, um, it keeps on popping up. We have all kinds of, uh, Jimmy John's has had a, a lot of problems with that. And, uh, and high quality restaurants as well. It's not the restaurant. It's, uh, it's the way it's handled in there. I'm feeling room temperature, room temperature, the organisms will grow. So that's not, you know, you, you're not growing them in a refrigerator. I'm sorry, I'm feeling a little guilty about the sprouts that I had just bought <laughs> at the co-op. <laughs> but I'm going to cross my fingers on this batch. <laughs> you know, soak them, soak them in good scotch. Well, I didn't realize that sprouts were an issue. I'm more concerned with mushrooms. Is there an uh, inherent danger there that I've always uh, thought about? They can well, kill you. Yeah, there's, there's certain mushrooms that um, are very poisonous. Uh, and uh, we had, now he's passed away, we had one of the most uh, prolific researchers here in Minnesota, uh, Clyde Christensen. And uh, in his book, about mushrooms, he wrote a nice book on mushrooms. He had a quote in the beginning. He says, uh, there are old mushroom pickers and there are bold mushroom pickers, but there are no old bold <laughs> mushroom pickers. So um, the, um, the, there's actually a, a different concern that uh, the Swiss research labs uh, have shown. In the typical white but button mushroom that we have, there is a uh, compound that's produced called agaritine, okay, which is a carcinogen. Now you got a natural product producing a carcinogen, and uh, they recommend no more than uh, one mushroom meal per month. I eat a lot of mushrooms. You know, you know. I mean, uh, another. I mean, another interesting one is um, concern about fried foods. And not from the fat standpoint, but the fact that in, in things like potatoes, uh, you have some uh, glucose that's in there. We want that for the browning reaction in the, in the fry and in the chip. You want that color to form. And we have uh, the potato has an amino acid pool that's very high in asparagine, a, a typical amino acid that we, it's not a required amino acid, but it's in the structure of most proteins. And uh, at high temperatures above about 130 degrees C, uh, the glucose reacts with the uh, asparagine to pr produce acrylamide, which is a carcinogen. Okay? And uh, <laughs> the typical youth who eats a bag of potato chips and maybe a large serving of uh, french fries from McDonald's. Uh, they get, in a day, they get 80 times the allowed level for uh, asparagine, for uh, acrylamide. I mean, and that's, you know, we're making it in our home, you know, as well as an in industry. What do we do? Uh, the, um, I mean, there are some treatments that have come up uh, of putting an uh, enzyme in the solution that you soak the potatoes in that will degrade the asparagine so you don't get that reaction. You know, or, or you fry it at lower temperature. How did we get to our age? How? <laughs> a good scotch every day. <laughs> you can tell me, I can tell you what's my favorite food. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right over here. Hi, um, you were talking a little bit about how water action and water activity wasn't really an idea that people in your industry and area were accepting of and how there was this, all this argument going about it. Is that something, is that a conversation, an argument that's still occurring? No. Or, okay. Yeah, it's not, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've finally convinced Slade and Levine that water <laughs> activity is important. And in fact, I've published a couple of papers with them. Okay, so uh, we've, we've solved that problem. It was, you know, they were, 
Uh, they were not food scientists and they didn't understand what, how we were using water activity and all that list of things, the paradigms that we came out of that, which were re really critical for food safety. Is the, can you recommend a, one or two sources of information to learn about just foods in general and healthy foods and what to avoid? And, um, and also just a couple decades ago, there were questions about peanut butter and should peanut butter be stored in a fridge or, or stored at room temperature because of some reaction within the peanut butter? Yeah, well, the, 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 um, I mean, that, that was a story, but the, the water activity of peanut butter is low enough that, you know, yeah, if you're going to store it for two years, yeah, there's a problem. But uh, critically, which we don't have an answer for, is uh, a good way to inactivate the microorganisms that are pathogens in the processing. Most nut plants in the United States were built 100 years ago, and they're not designed properly. And in the, in the peanut case of America, which 350 companies uh, had, were buying that peanut paste to make crackers like Kellogg's, uh, Kellogg's had an Atkins brand. Uh, they relied on a, what we call a certificate analysis from the company. And so uh, they didn't go out and inspect the plant. Uh, Nestle did. And the Nestle guy who went out and inspected the plant two years before the outbreak occurred said this was the worst plant he ever saw. I mean, there was holes in the roof. There were rodents all around the plant itself, uh, dirty uh, equipment and stuff like that. Uh, his company decided not to report that to the Food and Drug Administration. And this is one of the big uh, debates that I've had in my class of, of should they have done that? And it was on, on the exam. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a real critical issue. Uh, and um, you know, the, uh, there, are, there are ways that you can inactivate it, but they use a uh, propylene oxide gas, and you've got to have a very sp special plant to do that in. in there. And uh, it's, it's uh, dangerous for workers to use and stuff like that. So uh, uh, it is a risk in there. And again, it came from birds and animals running in the fields where the peanuts are. The peanuts are on the ground, and it gets on the shell. The peanuts get roasted, but they shell it first, okay? and uh, the shell produces a lot of dust in the plant, and after it's roasted, it's sitting in a room where this dust is coming down from the, from the shelling room, and that's the problem. You've got to have a plant that's built that allows for controlled air flows away from the finished product in there, and that was not done. And in uh, the worst case in here, which to me was the most egregious thing, was uh, the president of the company, uh, he, not on a regular basis, but he did send out um, uh, product from the plant that had tested positive for salmonella, and he wrote emails to his people, we, we need the money, send it out. So he completely ignored the fact that he had a positive salmonella in there. So with products that uh, blend, you're talking about uh, water activity. With products that blend dry and wet ingredients, you, you had mentioned like raisin bran, for example. You've got raisins in with crispy yeah. pieces, any number of examples of that. What do they do in the process to keep that water from transferring? Or do they just say, well, you better eat this quick? Well, you could put a shorter shelf life on the package. That's one thing. But... Uh, Kellogg's, I, I did some work with them. If you uh, take and soak the raisins in glycerol, you know, which is part of a fatty, a fatty acid molecule, a triglyceride mo molecule, you can lower the water activity down low enough, and the glycerol is liquid at room temperature, so it acts as a plasticizer. So it replaces the water, and you can get soft raisins. So their raisins, rice and rye, now have the, um, the glycerol-soaked raisins uh, in there. Uh, that's one way. Again, you got a name of a compound, and most people say, oh, I can pronounce it, but what the hell is this thing? You know, I don't want to eat that. Well, you're eating it every time you eat fat, <laughs> you know. So, is it, but uh, that's one way to do it. And there, I mean, people are working on edible barriers, uh, but we have found that the only good edible barrier is chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> or scotch, it sounds like. <laughs> That's a barrier to eating. <laughs> I hate to close off with a simple question, but is microwave cooking going to kill salmonella? Yes. Yes. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So cook, cooking, giving the right heat treatment. So, okay, on meat products, I mean, here's, uh, let me point out some of the stupidities in our regulatory system. Uh, under Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, okay, a food is adulterated if it contains any poisonous or deleterious substance. And under court cases that have been held, FDA, the present uh, detection methods we have today, we can detect one organism per 25 grams. On a weight basis, that's one in uh, one part in 10 to the 14th parts. That's a very small number. I'm working on some rapid techniques and new techniques to better detect that. Uh, and so any pathogen, if you detect it, you can't ship the food. And if you ship it and somebody gets ill, Bill Marler out of Seattle is going to sue you for it. Uh, uh, in meat, meat is not food. Meat is under the uh, Wholesome Meat Act, different act. Okay, uh, so meat, poultry, uh, what uh, was it? Uh, no, fish is food. Okay, I mean this is this is crazy. Buffalo, buffalo, is food. It's not meat. Yeah, this is this is crazy. But uh, back in 1974, the American Public Health Association sued the um, USDA. Earl Butts was then the um, uh, secretary. Uh, that uh, they, the, the APHS, wanted them to declare salmonella as a pathogen. We know it's a pathogen. Uh, USDA says, no, it's not a pathogen. And, and the judge ruled sort of in their favor. He said, he said okay, uh, what you should do is come up with some way of educating the consumer to cook. Okay, so that was 74. It took the U.S. Department of Agriculture 20 years, 20 years, to come up with that little white label that you see on raw meat, and it says cook thoroughly, you know, keep refrigerated. What the hell does cook thoroughly mean? Okay. You know? I mean, that's a, that's a real problem. Um, I uh, have a, a patent uh, of an invention that I worked with on 3M of a little tag that fits on the top of, let's say you buy a, a meal that has meat in it and stuff, and uh, it's a, a strip of white with two blue ends, and uh, when it reaches 60 degrees centigrade, the, the blue, it's basically wax melts and it moves to the center, and when it reaches the center so there's no more white, that means the product is done. It's a doneness indicator. But the doneness is based on how long you need to heat to kill salmonella in there. Uh, and um, I mean, I just, I think uh, that, and right now, uh, the rules that USDA has uh, leads to the fact that one in every pieces of poultry that you buy out of four, one out of four, 25%, probably has salmonella. Scary. So cook thoroughly, meaning up to about 165 Fahrenheit for a couple of seconds, that's, that's enough because there's heat, there's kill going on all the way and that would give you the thing. And the big problem more than anything else is not just the cooking but the, what we call the cross-contamination in handling of the product because uh, it'll get on your hands. Uh, you know, let's say you're preparing chicken uh, and you've cut it up in pieces, you put it in a, in a baking pan and uh, you take it over to the oven, open the oven door, put it in, okay, and then you say, oh yeah, I, I gotta wash my hands, so now I go wash my hands. Okay, now I prepare something else, uh, and then, uh, oh, I better check the chicken, so I go over, open the door, okay, and now you, got organisms on your hand, you go back and you mix the lettuce with your hands and uh, you've got cross-contamination. We don't think about it that way. I mean, uh, I scare most of the students <laughs> in my class. I teach a class called Food Safety Risk and Technology and uh, uh, the women in the class say this is the best class in learning how to avoid eating calories. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I have two last quick questions for you. The first is it just a yes or no. Would you eat a rare burger? You. No. Okay. No. Man, it's going to be a yeah. tough cafe to go home afterward. But, by the way, if you want a really good burger, uh, Halftime Wreck on Front Street <laughs> in, in uh, St. Paul. It's uh, right near Gabe's on Shenny Jack. It won the uh, best hamburger in the Twin Cities uh, oh. about two months ago. Oh. Yeah, two weeks ago, yeah. Great All right. hamburger. Well, and then my second question for you is just to, to wrap it up. I know a lot of people in here are home gardeners, really interested in you know getting organic, less processed foods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, would you, you know, for the home gardener or somebody who's processing food at home more so than from a you know, raw state, I guess, um, what are your recommendations? And also, would you do you err on the side of more processing or less processing when you think about nutrition and health and food? Well, we we can't we can't supply the world with fresh food. Okay, that's the problem. So we, you know, we, I mean, the Romans learned that, and that's where processing first started. Uh, so some processing is good. We we got to have good processes that that are safe, you know, whatever. And uh, yeah, local is better, but uh, organic. Um, a good example, uh, I can't remember which state, just a, about a month ago, uh, uh, one of the states, I think it was Virginia, passed a law that you can sell raw milk, okay? And uh, one of the uh, senators brought, bought some, brought it to the, West Virginia, okay, brought it to the state capitol, everybody drank it, and they all got sick, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the largest organic milk uh, farm in uh, California, uh, uh, they they make raw milk, and uh, here's w what I think is a, the wrong thing: is that people brought it, they brought it home, and they had their kids drink it. I mean, they can make a choice. I don't think they should be feeding their children that. And eight kids are in a hospital with uh, two of them with HUS syndrome, you know, uh, hem hemolytic uremics, and they're going to be on dialysis for 20 years. Yeah. And that's a shame. Wow. All right. Well, All right. well thank, thank you, you so much for being here tonight. Thanks, folks, for being here. <laughs> Dr. Labuza.